Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our uh, event tonight. Uh, my name is Apa Similani. It is truly, for me, a personal pleasure and privilege uh, to say a few words about our very esteemed guest tonight. We are in the midst of a very important historic experience. Never in the 3,000-year history of Iran have we had a diaspora. We have had three massive exilic experiences, all related to Islam. The first wave came with the advent of Islam in Iran and the migration of many of Iran's Zoroastrians to India. The second wave came when Shiism was made a state religion in Iran with the power of the Safavid sword. Another Zoroastrian migration that helped create the Parsi community in India. This third wave after the Islamic revolution of 1979 is more massive than ever before. Today, almost 10% of Iran's population live in exile. But this, is, this third wave is different from the other two waves, not just because it's more massive, but it has helped create for the first time in our history an Iranian diaspora. People of diaspora are those who live in one place and dream of another. People who have a constant craving for news of home, who entertain the hope or maybe the illusion of returning. That's a very different experience than an exile who has found roots. We now have a diaspora. For us in our culture, words like qurbat, qurbati, muhajirat, all conjure a negative sentiment. For us, as a culture, we have had a very troubled relationship with the exilic experience. Exiles are, in the words of one uh, critic, custodians of dead treasures. Exiles, in the words of Adorno, another famous critic, are uh, people who live mutilated lives people whose experience, whose language has been expropriated, people whose historical context, whose memory, whose desires have been sapped by the exilic experience. But diaspora, while nourishing these nostalgic longings, is also about building new lives here. It's about trying to transcend the limits of Qurbat. Bahiyye Nahjavani, in her most recent book, Us and Them, has provided us with an insightful searingly honest, unsparingly nuanced, and detailed, but also invariably loving portrait of our tormented, exilic experience. The cast of characters include a grieving mother surviving by nurturing the illusion of her son's survival, a conniving so-called friend in Iran who fosters this illusion and melts her of every last piece of her jewelry, from writers who embellish reality to, to fit the demands of a Manichaean market in America, to siblings engaged in petty rivalries and grand illusions. Her prose is precise, parsimonious, always poetic, resonant with discrete literary illusions to masterpieces of literature. If one of the masterpieces and harbingers of modern literature was Jamal Zadeh's Khulqiyat Ma Irania, uh, the habits of us Persians. Uh, but, but Nakhjavani has cleverly taken that us and counterposed it to that comforting shadow, that them that are everything we desire or detest in ourselves and our exilic community. It is, I think, impossible to, reach, to read this rich, funny, clever narrative and not find in it both all too many of the damaged lies we often around us, but also by the alchemy of her creation, find salvation in the text. Jews have lived in diaspora for 3,000 years. They are most familiar with the diaspora experience. In the words of George Steiner, a famous literary critic, for Jews, survival can be found in the text. For us, us and them might be the beginning of the text for our survival in exile. Uh, Bahiyye Nakhjavani not only writes with incredible grace in English, but she also writes in French, 
with equal grace. She is, as far as I know, the only published bilingual, acclaimed by critics, a fiction writer in Iran. I know of no fiction writer born in Iran, writing in English, who writes with as, great, as much grace, as much erudition, as much suppleness of form as Bahia Nahjavani. I am always humbled reading her prose to think that someone who comes from the same land as I come writes in English and in French with such dexterity, with such erudition, and with such humanity. This is her fourth novel. I'm glad to say Stanford has helped bring two of them to English. Uh, Us and Them is the most recent one. Uh, a Woman Who Read Too Much is the other novel. Both of them have been published by Stanford University Press. Uh, and uh, um, we were fortunate to have her here when she presented her book. Uh, her talk on that uh, is available on our YouTube. You should go and see it. Uh, and I could, as you can imagine, go much longer singing her praise. I'm a big fan of hers, as you can imagine. Uh, but I think every t uh, minute I take, I will de be denying you the opportunity to hear and see her, because she's not only a great writer, she's not only a great humanist, she's a remarkable performer. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Nahia Nafkabah. Professor Milani talks in such a way that you learn what it is you should be doing in life. And you realize all that you haven't achieved because he places the bar so high and you realize he's talking about somebody else entirely. But I would like, first of all, to really thank him above all persons for having had this privilege for the third time to come to this distinguished university and to be honored by the uh, Iranian Studies Program of Hamid and Christina Moradem. I'm so privileged to be their guest and to be invited by Professor Milani. And the title that I chose for this talk really does reflect um, how much trust he's put in me and how far I am still from deserving it. Because he invited me the first time, sight unseen, and I was indeed coming from nowhere as far as he was concerned. He'd never met me. He had no idea who I was really, except on trust through those who he trusted. And he invited me to speak about a book which hadn't even been published. So I was coming here talking about something which didn't exist, and he was kind enough to let me come from that nowhere the first time. And the second time, again, he invited me to come and speak about a woman who had become a woman from nowhere because for 150 years in her own land, she had been denied recognition. And I had written a book inspired by the life of this great Goratul Ain Tahereh, a figure who had become unknown in her own culture. And so for the second time, I was coming, in a sense, from nowhere. And now again, Surprise, surprise, I'm here for something completely different, as Monteverdi, uh, as Monteverdi, I mean Monty Python would say. <laughs> now for something completely different. This is not a story uh, based in Iran, as it should be, if it was to deserve the honor of this invitation. It's not a story about Iranians living in Iran in the past, so it's not even about the history of Iran. It literally is coming from nowhere because if we're to believe um, my prime minister in the UK who said that if you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. I don't know if you're aware of this extraordinary statement um, by um, uh, Mrs. Theresa May. I thought it might be interesting to start with that in order to contextualize the reason why I called this talk um, coming from nowhere. On October the 5th, just after the um, interesting referendum that 
enabled Great Britain to step free of the European Union, which was a sort of anticipation of what has happened in this country, I believe. So there's a certain connection there between uh, what happened last year uh, and what happened here. Uh, Theresa May, in a conference of the Conservative Party, claimed that many people in positions of power behave as though they have more in common with international elites than with people down the road, people they employ, people they pass on the street. But if you believe that you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. You don't understand what citizenship means. I was really struck when I heard her saying that. I said to myself, goodness me, you know, what if you're not privileged to be part of that international elite? What if you just happen to have studied or married or moved or been forced out of your own country for innumerable reasons and found yourself living not only in one but several countries? What if you happen to be the one that is employed or the one who you happen to pass down the street? and you don't 100% belong anywhere, but you are really a citizen of many wares, where does that put you? So I realized that we need to redefine our citizenship. I found myself thinking of who I was, and I realized that for the first time, I had a story to tell that was about people like me. And instead of talking about the history of Iran, instead of talking about the past, I realized I have this magnificent display of human beings around me like your good selves. And this was a mirror that could be placed up to find out who I was. I look at you, I look at me, I look at us, I look at them. Who are we, the Iranians who are scattered all over the world? And I realized that we're a very interesting group of people because I think we are excuse me, this is a very Persian thing to say, I think we're rather unique. <laughs> I mean, there are many migrant communities all over the world, as we know. The whole question of refugees is the hot topic of our age. But I do believe the Persians, the Iranian version of this group of scattered people, is unique because I think we've done it rather well. I think we've achieved it in an extraordinarily successful way. First of all, we're everywhere, and you don't normally find every group of refugees or migrants everywhere on the planet. I mean, I don't think I've come across any country where there isn't a Persian kebab shop or a, or a carpet shop or something of that order. The other thing which I, I really felt was, was interesting about us is that... Uh, we are a people, and I'm, I'm so delighted, and I, I really would like to thank the wonderful team at Redwood Press for having chosen a cover which reflects the, the central metaphor that I want to communicate in this talk, which is that of the mirror. We Persians love mirrors. We love glass, we love mirrors, we love reflections, we love the distortions of mirrors, we love the multiplicity of the facets that we get in mirrors. We've made an art of broken mirrors because we are ourselves, in some ways, broken mirrors. And I came across a quite interesting remark by James Joyce, which I thought I could begin with, having laid Mrs. May to one side. I thought I would quote to you a statement by James Joyce when he was trying to sell um, the Dubliners to a publisher. And he couldn't get it sold. It was nine years before he got it sold. I felt a certain affinity to that gap because I'd had a similar experience that I wouldn't compare myself to the master of Ulysses, not for a thousand years. But he got so frustrated that he turned to one of his publishers and he said, I seriously believe that you will retard the course of civilization in Ireland by preventing the Irish people from having a good look at themselves 
in my nicely polished looking glass. Now, I wouldn't even dare to suggest that I would retard the progress of civilization by not showing us a picture of them, the Iranian us and them, but I do think that looking at our shattered glass, looking at the facets of who we are, looking at the multiplicity of our contradictions in the world is a way of understanding a little bit about our strengths, our weaknesses, our dreams, our hopes, our you know, perhaps illusions, uh, which are retarding, perhaps, what we could achieve even better. Retarding, perhaps, our own country. I would hazard to suggest that, and I'll come back to that point at the end. So we have a thousand and one faces. We have a thousand and one voices. And I knew that there was no way I could write a story about the Iranian diaspora without capturing that. And in the first chapter, I thought I would just read to you a few uh, phrases, words that I um, have used here to explore why it is I structured this book the way I did. Because the other way in which I'm coming from nowhere, not only in terms of my own personal background, which I'll just speak about shortly afterwards, but also in terms of my presumptions in, in writing, is that I constantly try to structure books in very complicated ways. And my poor readers have this terrible task of trying to figure out where I'm coming from. What kind of genre, in a literary sense, does this belong to? So in this book, there are two voices. There is a collective voice, which is the voice of we. And now, of course, we Persians have a special word for that, a way of defining that we. When we say we, when we say, this is a ma which is not the royal we, nor is it the editorial we. It's a very Persian we. It's a we which is a kind of, how can I put it, sometimes, dare I say, falsely modest we. It's the kind of we which says, I don't want to say that I said anything. I don't want to presume to be an ego pushing myself in front of it. No, I step back. I'm discreet. I'm modest. I say ma. So it's got a very special quality, this we of the Persians. In its best sense, in its most sincere sense, I do believe it is the most exquisite form of courtesy and humility that you can find on the planet. I don't think anybody else uses it to that degree of perfection. But I do think that we have the capacity to use it in other ways, in more distorted ways. Sometimes we use it even to avoid responsibility. And the reason I chose that we is for this purpose. I'm going to read you now from the first chapter, which is called Us. In Us, I'm looking for the book about the Persian diaspora, the Iranian diaspora. There was plenty of evidence of first-person singular Iranians on the, bookshelf sh on the bookshop sh shelves, but we were not the focus of attention. Subjective stories abounded in the chain stores, but these were not about the real us. They were about individuals we could barely identify with, a country that no longer existed, a past of aesthetic sensibility, belonging to the academic few, or a place for the very rich, for the very religious, the very feminist, or the very anti-feminist, the anti-religious, the anti-rich even. There were biographies of those associated with the peacock throne, or conspiracy theories about the fall of Mossadegh, or the true confessions of those who remembered Hitler and our oil in World War II, or the fictional memoirs of pivotal figures of the Constitutional Revolution. But none of these stories was actually about the hydra-headed, contradictory, paradoxical us, the multiple, first-person plural us 
in Toronto and Sydney, in Bogota and Beijing, speaking Persian all over the world. Now, I, was, I wish that Professor Miloni had continued talking in the first pra paragraphs of his introduction. I could have cut out all the flattery and the beautiful things he said about me, which were hardly true, especially the question about me writing in French, but I'll tell you about that afterwards. Um, because what he said about the diaspora and the waves of Persian diaspora was so fascinating to me personally. This is about the collective we, but let me begin a little bit about my own diaspora, just to give you some idea of another trickle of a diaspora. Well, it wasn't entirely a mass movement, but in my case, my personal diaspora in my family began in the 19th century. My family, three generations back, were forced to flee from Iran, from Tabriz in particular, in the 1860s. We were a wave of early Persians who did not come out seeking their good fortune, looking for education, trying to better their lives, but were actually chased out of the country, found themselves exiled, in the case of my great-great-grandfather, he actually bought his own ticket into exile and became a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire in order to stay in the entourage of that early group of Baha'is who fled from Iran as a result of the persecution. So it's very interesting for me to realize that these very, very early groups of Baha'is who left Iran were the beginning of a wave that reached its climax in this century, in the last century, with the revolution. Other Iranians who were not Baha'is, who found themselves in a very similar situation, having to flee, having to leave their homes. So I found this a really interesting pattern that I was part, I was partly at the beginning of this extraordinary movement of what Professor Milani very rightly calls the third wave of exile. Just before I stop that story, I want to add one little point about it. Because again, in his mar marvelous introduction, Professor Milani evoked that nostalgia, that melancholy, that sen sense of being torn, of being ripped untimely from your own place, from your own home space, which is part of the definition of exile. And he used the word muhajir, which of course, as Iranians, we know in the context, which is, as he said, very rightly, has negative connotations. Interestingly, the word has very positive connotations for Baha'is, strangely enough. So we've taken that same word and turned it into something positive. And just as that first wave of early, early exiled Iranians in the 19th century were perhaps the beginning of a crested wave that reached its peak with the Islamic Revolution, perhaps our redefinition of the word muhajir could help us as Iranians today in redefining our place in the world, in turning something which could otherwise be a sense of loss and, and a wound that will not heal, a sense of nostalgia and yearning for something which cannot be recreated, turning that into something infinitely more constructive and positive. I believe I have seen it in the Iranian diasporan community. I believe it is visible amongst us today in some of the great artists and writers and thinkers that we have in the exiled Iranian community, and I believe its potential for becoming something spearheading a positive movement, not only for Iranian refugees, but for the migrant communities of the world. Because this is a phenomenon that we're living with that is affecting all of us across the world today. And I don't want to get deep into the politics of it, but I am assuming you all know what I mean. We are living in a time where the human race is being exiled. We are even being exiled in our own homes. 
I came across a wonderful quote, which I've now forgotten to have brought with me, but it comes from Mohsen Hamid's new book, Exit West, which is a magnificent analysis also, an exploration, very poetic, a sort of magical realism uh, exploration of exile. He wrote uh, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, and he's a great, great Pakistani writer. And in this little quote, he says, everyone is a migrant because we all find ourselves displaced even in our own times, even wherever we live, even here in America, I find it so strong. I came through immigration and I realized I had come to a country filled with migrants because people did not know where they belonged anymore. People found themselves displaced because of the political situation here. So this condition of being a migrant is something common to many of us in the world. So let's get on with this whole issue of therefore who are the voices in my story? I decided I couldn't tell just an individual story about me, because then I would be like all the other subjective stories about the, the Iranian diaspora. We had to tell a story about us, this paradoxical, complex, multiple us. And that's why I chose to write many of the chapters in this book in the point of view of we. Now, these we's, are very different, and I'll just give you a quick summary of who some of them are. You have the older generation of we, sometimes male, sometimes female, who have what Professor Milani was describing, that sense of nostalgia for that other world, that, oh, if only we could go back to that world. You've got the we that is the new generation, the young kids who are saying, oh my God, you know, why do they go on? Why can't they speak English properly? Why can't they, you know, pronounce words properly? They're such an embarrassment. They smell of gormisabzi. You know, this kind of youthful we. You've got the we that is the we of the young women, the we that is the older women, the we that is male, the we that is. Uh, you know, the kind of we where we ha I have a young uh, lawyer, for example, whose family expect him to do all the legal work for nothing. You know, you know those we's, you know? Oh, you're a doctor? Oh, I've got this problem with my thumb. You know? Oh, you're a lawyer? Oh, I've got this. Can you help me? You know? So this kind of we's that we have in our Persian communities, we are all aware of. Then we've got the sort of um, post-revolutionary exile who comes out of Iran and meets the pre-revolutionary exile and is suspicious of that person, you know. Are they the same as us or are they different? We came out because, you know, we had a reason to come out. Why did they come out? You know, so we've got all of these kinds of differences and splits between us. We've got the kind of we I'm probably one of them, who make a career out of being in exile. I come across wonderful human beings who've stood up at the public forum and raved about the human rights problems in Iran, and they're making a lot of money on it. This is a fantastic profession. Hooray for the human rights problems in Iran. I've managed to published three books on the subject, and I've been given, you know, invitations to X number of countries. This is my profession. I don't want the, you know, the human rights issue to completely disappear, because otherwise, what would I do? My profession would be gone. So, I mean, we've got all of us involved in, in these different groups of we. We've got the we in the Iranian cultural associations. And all of those we's who think that we are preserving Persian culture, and then we get into conflict with other people who are preserving Persian culture. And then we want to do it this way, but they're doing it that way, but we get our hackles up because we are doing it the right way and they're doing it the wrong way. And they're in, you know, attracting those kinds of people. And okay, so you attract those kinds of people, them will attract us. So even within our own exiled community, we have multiple ways of being we. In between, the chapters, which are about all these different facets of the collective psyche of the Iranian peoples in exile, I have a story. 
And Professor Milani described it very beautifully. It's really a dysfunctional family story. It's very simple. It's about a mother, it's about her daughters, it's about how they have found themselves scattered across the world, one, in, one daughter in Paris, the other daughter in LA. I really have presumption to come to America and speak about the LA daughter. I don't know how I'm going to face it when I go down to LA. <laughs> But I thought I would quickly give you a little taste of some of these different characters so that you will be introduced. First of all, this is an image of the mother. She finds herself in, uh, in France. She's gone to visit the youngest daughter. And she's um, having a hard time because she doesn't know the language. She's isolated from people in her own community. It's a kind of, she's not sure she wants to mix with the Iranian uh, exile community because there are difficulties in her family and she doesn't want them all gossiping about her. And she's got a sort of pride and so she's not yet quite assimilated. And so she's quite lonely in actual fact. And she goes to a park and this is her experience. She's sitting on a bench and it's cold. The old lady tucked her skirt close on the bench and pulled the edge of her Californian seersucker coat around her knees. Her ankles had puffed up as usual and looked like blue and purple sausages inside their tight nylon sheaths. She felt chilly under her skirts and very upset that the scarf did so little to stop her hair from being buffeted by the stiff autumn breeze. France was also cold in other ways. Bonjour, she nodded timidly to her neighbor. She's sitting next to a French lady. It sounded like bonjour. She could never quite get a handle of the accent. The French woman turned slightly away, ignoring her. In fact, she looked rather nervous, as well as disapproving. And who could blame her? trapped in the middle of a seesaw of a bench with an elderly Iranian in a headscarf sitting at one end and a pile of pigeon droppings at the other. She stays there for as long as she can bear. She's thinking about her family and she sighs because she's realizing she's a burden on her daughters. She sighed again at the thought of burdening her daughters. She didn't particularly want to die in America either, she's been thinking. She doesn't want to die in France. They cut off the trees too, too brutally. It would be difficult to die in France, but she doesn't want to die in America either. All the general, her husband, all the general's brass buttons had been flattened into a plaque half covered with grass in the cemetery. And she certainly did not want to be flattened next to him. Even an overclipped tree was better than that. Her French neighbor, with tinted hair, flinched at her sigh. It was clearly intolerable to hear a foreigner sigh, not only once, but twice, and she must have interpreted it as criticism towards the Republic, for she rose abruptly at that moment and moved away. Bibi John was flustered. She wanted to apologize didn't have the words. It was useless anyway because of her accent and lack of vocabulary. Oh, Rava, she called out faintly as the French woman turned on her heel and ground across the gravel. But it was clear from the woman's enraged back as she stalked on towards the gate that the effort towards reconciliation and politesse had not been enough. Now, when she goes to America, this is the daughter she meets. The eldest daughter is called Goli. You know how we Persians love to have a kind of rhythm and a rhyme. Either we have all our names starting with the same consonant, or we have them all ending in the same vowel. So this is Bibi, Lili, Goli, Ali, you know. So Goli is the eldest. And Goli is a bit of a bimbo-looking kind of Goli. She's got blonde hair, and she is large boobs, nose job, you know, the whole bit. <laughs> She's gone to a pedicure shop. 
Gully was upset, and her feet knew it. They were in desperate need. That's how the brochure put it. Are your feet in desperate need? That should be said with an American accent. And hers were. There was a solution, of course, as there was for everything in America. Step inside, pedicure perfect, and we'll change all that, said the brochure. So Golly stepped inside, sat herself down on one of the slippery pink chairs, and prepared to be changed by all that. She has a daughter called Deli, of course. Deli is a teenager, paints her toenails black, watches vampire movies, can't stand Persian rice, hates the smell of garlic, but actually becomes a wonderful human being at the end of the story. So I do encourage you to have a bit of patience with Deli at the age of 16. She's worth it, I tell you. She's got potential. And in order to give you the full scope, let me read you a little bit about Lily, the second daughter. Lily is the youngest. Lily's had a tough life. Lily left home too young, got into trouble, got out of trouble, turned herself into an artiste, and lives in a shishi part of Paris in the Marais, where she takes pictures, photographs of women nothing. So it's very hard for Bibi John to come to her apartment and see all these photographs of naked women. So she has a tough time with Lily because Lily is acerbic, kind of angry, rather sort of adolescent, terminally so. And as the story progresses, Lily also has to come to grips with the fact that her dear old mother is there for good. She's going to have to cope with this old lady whom she abandoned when she was, or she was abandoned, you don't know which it is, from the very young age in her teens. And now Goli, I mean Lily, finds that Iran has come to her in the form of her mother. In the beginning, she's aggressive, she's fighting. But as time goes on, there again, interaction with that them, the Iranians from Iran, who were the other, suddenly begins to influence her. Now, of course, from her mother's point of view, she has become them because she's left Iran and become totally westernized with all these naked ladies on the, on the walls. She's one of them now. She's become a stranger. In the course of the story, you see them coming together. You see the same thing happening with Goli, who has become a them and then becomes aware that she is us. So in the story of Lily, there is a final goodbye. And Lily takes her mother to the airport. And I'm going to read you a little bit of that. It was true that Bibi had grown visibly weaker during her stay in France. When she swayed through the departure gates at Charles de Gaulle the day before, Lily saw how fragile she had become, how vulnerable and old. Bibi was walking with difficulty on her stump-like legs as she passed through immigration control. She fumbled for her passport like a blind person, delaying everyone behind her in the security queue. Watching the little figure anxiously over the heads of the crowd, Lily wondered if she would ever come back, if she would ever see her mother again. Would she have one more chance of glimpsing that wispy crown of white hair at the arrivals, bobbing towards her instead of away behind the luggage cart? After the final wave goodbye, Lily had suddenly remembered with a stab of chagrin and a surge of guilt that in spite of Fatty's last minute reminders, she had forgotten to ask for wheelchair assistance for Bibi John. And she recalled that Goli had, done, had not done so either when her, their mother traveled over to the state, from the States. The thought was unbearable. She was furious with herself even angrier than she'd been with her sister 
or with Bahman or with Mehdi, even more disgusted than she'd been with Fatih, there was no point in comparison. They were all as bad as each other. I wanted to give you that little snippet because I think that part of what we need to achieve, and I do believe it is a constructive achievement in the diaspora, is not to look for blame, to recognize our responsibility for where we are, for what we do, in order that we can achieve more than maybe we had done when we were back at home. Home. I really do want to emphasize that I think this act of leaving one's comfort zone, the place one calls a home, and arriving at where we feel we're nowhere, is actually the most wonderful possibility for us to begin to know who we are. It's an opportunity for us to know ourselves. I thought it would be helpful also to realize that being neither here nor there, finding ourselves with a foot in both worlds, is something that is shared by many, many people. And I found an interesting comment by a, a, a curiously complex combination of a writer, Sierra Leonean Scottish, okay? Amina, uh, Aminata Forno. I don't know if you've read her work. Can you imagine Sierra Leone in West Africa, Scottish in the north of England, north of Great Britain, and here she is, a combination of the two, this young, beautiful black woman with a very strong Scottish accent. And she wrote, she sees herself as a hyphenated writer, Scottish Sierra Leonean. She says, sometimes we need labels just to be able to describe the things we're talking about. But labels confirm the limitations of language. When they are overused, they can become limiting. We live at a time where branding has become the norm. And I think branding is an interesting phenomenon. You have to help me with the history. But it seems that at the end of colonialism, at the end of empires, we began to worry about who we are. And so we combined marketing and tribalism and turned it into branding. So we could sell our identities, so that we could be someone. This is, seems to have been a phenomenon across the world. You can no longer just be an American, you have to be an Iranian American. Or you have to be whichever split of gender or language or whatever. Suddenly, we, we find ourselves splitting into tiny, you know, significances of identity. Why do we do that? Why do we feel the need to do that? Why do we take refuge in it? It's almost as if it's a, it's a form of self-defense. This is who I am. This is my label. You know, one of the points I, I make in, in the story of Goli is that when she comes into Pedicure Perfect, and I just have to read this last little bit, that sums up this question of branding. When she sits there waiting, she sees the girl who's going to come to help her. And the girl who was going to change all that was called Cymbeline. The tag on her left breast said so. Americans had this habit of repeating your name every two seconds and expecting you to do the same. Goli looked at the spelling for a long time, not sure of the word. She'd heard of American and even Persian girls called Kim, but this sounded like the name of a logging company in Canada or something, or a product to keep household germs at bay, as they said, or a multinational that made sanitary pads. She hoped the girl didn't think she was staring at her breasts. She was only trying not to cry. Huh. Hi, Kim. She finally mumbled with a brave smile as the girl settled down with her pink tray. Can you rub me, please? That's all I need to be honest. To be honest. It was a phrase her husband used all the time. This labeling, which is captured in this little scene, is something quite profound about the sense of who we are and our identity. And I wanted to just read to you something also written 
by two other great writers, Jose Saramago, the great author of Blindness, who said about his own condition of where he lived because he was from Portugal and found himself living in the Canary Islands off the coast of Spain. And he, he admitted, he said, the sensation I have in Lisbon now is that I don't know where to go anymore. When I go back home, I don't know where I belong. I don't know how to be in Lisbon anymore. When I'm there for a few days, or for a week or two, of course, I go back to my old habits. But I'm always thinking about coming back here to Lazarote, Canary Islands, as soon as possible. So he's found himself on the fence with a foot in two worlds. Now, in this condition of being in two worlds, we can be split up the middle, of course, especially if we cannot identify only with either us or them. And in the words of Marilyn Robinson, the great American writer, this was a great warning I found about the issue of branding. She, she is really interesting because she herself has her own very distinctive brand. You couldn't find a more American writer if you tried. And yet somehow she's achieved a kind of universality in spite of that. And she wrote the following about this question of us and them. Whenever people draw a bright line between an us and a them, those on the other side of the line are assumed to be unworthy of respect or hearing and are in fact to be regarded as a huge problem to the us who, who presume to judge them. When this assumption, this is the interesting part, when this assumption takes hold, the definitions of community harden and become violently exclusive and defensive. Definitions of us and them begin to contract, and as they shrink and narrow, they become inflamed, dangerous, and inhumane. This tedious pattern has repeated itself endlessly through human history and is the end of community and the beginning of tribalism. I think we all know how that is affecting the world today. We're in a world where that kind of tribalism is rampant and it has produced that hardening of the arteries, the hardening of the mental cells almost. It's cr it produced a kind of contraction of communities so that people are in division from each other, in separation, in opposition. Because that's the other interesting thing that happens with branding. It, it is accompanied by a kind of fierce competition. It's almost as if, if I have this identity, it has to be in opposition or contradiction or against some other group with their identity. In fact, it's us versus them. It's us or them. It produces a false choice. There's, there's a wonderful philosopher, Mary Midgley, who wrote about false choices. And I think the beginning of our discernment about who we are and anyone who is in that state of fluid uncertainty about where we are is to think in terms of... of uh, this question of whether we are us or them, us versus them, or us and them. And the reason I made this book have the ampus sand connecting us and them, and I didn't want to make it us and them in the American sense. I wanted it to be us and them, as if it was one word, as if it is an identity in itself, that we are inclusive, that we are combining, not separating our identities. It was because I feel we're living at a critical time of choice, where we really do have a choice between it being versus and or, or and. And I think the and is what will heal us, it's what will construct a society, it's what will bring a future that is more positive for us, and the or is the dangerous thing that Marilyn Robinson is warning us against, this tedious pattern which repeats itself throughout human history. 
There have been many people who have tried to leapfrog over the problem of us and them. And the earliest, of course, in terms of the 20th century women writers that I wanted to echo, because if you've noticed, other than Jose Marie Samar Samar Saramago, everybody else I've referred to as being a woman, I didn't mean that, but it just so happened, um, was Virginia Woolf, who's, who wrote, as a woman, I have no country. As a woman, I want no country. As a woman, my country is the world. I don't know what Theresa May would have said to her. But she was, as Theresa May is, a privileged woman. She had the privilege of being able to say that. She belonged to the upper classes, to the very elite that Theresa May was warning against. And there are, as we know, those of us who have lost everything, who could not just say, I have no country, glibly like that. It's because their country has been taken from them that they would say, I have no country. And it would be a very different message that they would give. And I don't want to suggest for a second that the choices we make should be in ignorance or in denial of that very real sense of deprivation and loss, the exile that's caused by war and famine and poverty and despair, or simply another executive order. I think I've probably come to the point where I should look at my watch. If it could be possible for us to make the choice in a positive way, as I'm suggesting, again, in the words of Aminata Forno, the way of literature, she says, is to seek universality. Writers try to reach beyond those things that divide us, culture, class, gender, race. Given the chance, we would resist classification. I have never met a writer who wishes to be described as a female writer, a gay writer, a black writer, Asian writer, or African writer. We just yearn, she says, to be called writers. And I would add, preferably human beings. If it's possible for us to find ways to make that, that constructive choice, I think we will be on the path of doing what I had hoped to suggest at the beginning, that our diasporadic experience is something to be modeled after, to be emulated, to be admired, and to be given as an inspiration to others. I think I'll just end here with one last quote. And this comes from the Baha'i writings and has always been an inspiration to me. It's about language. It's about the power of that wonderful word, word, with a capital W, which is the ancient symbol of the incarnation of our highest ideals in human action. It could be applied to science. It certainly can be applied to any effort that an individual writer makes to try to bring the creative act into being. In his words, he says, through that word, the realities of all created things were shaken, were divided, separated, scattered, combined, and reunited, disclosing in both the contingent world and the heavenly kingdom, the invisible, entities of a new creation, and revealing in the unseen realms the signs and tokens of unity and oneness. I think what we are seeing in the world today is that very dividing, shaking, scattering, separating. And we have to be at the forefront of the uniting, of the recombining, of the recreating a new form, a new creation, a new set of human values 
that will bring us into a larger unity, a wider circle of inclusion rather than exclusion. Thank you.